Greetings and welcome to another lecture in comparative psychology. This particular lecture is dealing with, perhaps not surprisingly given the title, aggression. Aggression is also known as agonistic behavior. And basically it involves, as you might expect, sending either, it, it can either be physical combat, which is what we tend to think of when we think of aggression. We think of actually individuals fighting one another, but it can also include sending threatening signals. Now, these threatening signals and animals, uh, non-human animals, may be body language, they may be sounds, they may be scents, they may be almost anything. In humans, they can also, by the way, be body language, or we, we oftentimes use threatening signals in terms of language. But even just sending the threatening signals is also aggression. So it's not just actual fighting, it's also being aggressive in pretty much any other way, being threatening. Now, animals fight for many reasons. I mean, if you think about it, there's lots of reasons that animals would fight. They'll fight to protect themselves. They'll fight to protect their territories, to protect their families. They'll fight to uh, ha get mating rights. They'll fight to get food. They'll fight to all sorts of reasons why individuals fight. Males in particular uh, will will fight, I mean, it's, it's a cliche, but they may fight at the drop of a hat. Males in particular often seem to be ready to fight. And it's probably because males, it, it may all go back to the whole males not getting mating opportunities as much as females. So males may be much more interested, for instance, in status or in dominance hierarchies. Who is in charge? Uh, a lot of animals have dominance hierarchies. In fact, sometimes they have it to the point where one of the terms for a dominance hierarchy is a pecking order. That comes from chickens. Because chickens will have a pecking order, will quite literally higher ranked chickens will peck, will behave aggressively toward lower ranked chickens. And so what chicken can peck other chickens, you know, I mean, it's, it basically defines what their hierarchy is. And those on the higher ends of the hierarchies tend to have more power, they have more status, they get more food, they get more mating opportunities. So whether it's males or females, females can also have hierarchies in terms of which female is in charge, that sort of thing. So that's one reason to fight, or at least to behave aggressively. Because as we're going to find out, not all fighting is actually, you know, not all aggression is actually fighting. There's a lot of aggression that is just posturing, that is just threatening. Because fighting, of course, has a cost, and we'll talk more about that later. One of the reasons individuals fight, of course, is as part of the fight-or-flight response. They are being threatened. That's what the fight-or-flight response is the response to. There is a threat. And the individual may choose to either fight or they may choose to run away. And so this is a decision that has to be weighed, which would be better, which is the one that we should choose. And when we're looking at it at the ultimate level, we're looking at it in terms of costs and benefits. What is the cost of fighting? Well, one could be injured, one could be killed, one could wind up uh, with, you know, losing status. Then again, one could also gain status, one could wind up winning and therefore get the resource that they may be fighting over. Um, so there's always costs and benefits. With fleeing, well, with fleeing, there's not going to be any injury, but fleeing does cost energy. It may cost in terms of uh, chances to find food or chances to reproduce or uh, chances to pass the genes down to the next generation. If a parent flees instead of fighting to defend their offspring, then they will probably lose those offsprings and that chance. So all of these get weighed. And in general, if the benefits of victory outweigh the cost of fighting, you're going to see fighting. Okay? There's going to be fighting because if they win, it's really good. And if they lose, I mean, if the, if the cost of losing is, is certain death, then you're probably not going to see a lot of fighting. But generally, the cost of losing is not certain death. That might be probable death, but it's not certain death. So all of these things need to be weighed. All of these things need to be considered. 
before an animal decides and realize that this can happen in a very short period of time. This is not something that animals are going to spend a lot of time, you know, dwelling over because they don't have that amount of time. So it's something that is needs to be weighed very, very, very quickly. Now, the proximate level, remember, is immediate causes. We talked about ultimate and proximate earlier in the book. And so the immediate cause is what will trigger the fighting, okay? Assume the costs and the benefits have been weighed. What will trigger it? And a lot of what triggers fighting in animals, human and non-human, are basically things like hormones. There are biological triggers to fighting. For instance, androgens. Androgens are male hormones. We tend to think of androgens as being things like testosterone, and testosterone is definitely a major androgen, but also other things that we humans lump together in terms of steroids are also androgens. They basically increase male secondary sexual characteristics. They increase uh, muscle mass, that sort of thing. And we found in non-human animals, I'm not sure how much is this has been done in human animals, although I suspect we'll see something similar. But androgens tend to be more common at a higher level in dominant animals. Um, this has been seen in many different species. Your book goes into a number of examples of this and cases of this. And in fact, these androgens tend to be linked to fighting rather than fleeing. The higher the amount of androgen, the more likely that individual is going to fight. It's why humans on steroids very often get into a lot of fights. Humans that sort of are amped up on those androgens, on those male hormones, themselves get into a lot of fights. And what's also interesting is that the result of fighting can indeed increase androgens. Um, males, and probably females as well, but certainly males who win fights have an increase in androgens. Now, there's some discussion, there's, there's some evidence that this indeed, the increase of androgen is a consequence of winning a fight, but also realize that this could be sort of a positive feedback loop. Individual wins a fight, the androgens increase, which makes them more likely to pick a fight, which may make them more likely to win a fight, because they have, which makes them more likely to pick a fight, more likely to win a fight. It's a positive feedback loop. And indeed, there's something called the winning effect, where winning a fight makes future wins more likely. Some of this may have to do with the androgens. Some of it may have to do with sort of the psychological benefits of winning. Comes with that increased uh, belief that, yes, I won once, I can win again. And while we, again, that's something that we can't necessarily measure in non-human animals, I suspect it's something that we definitely can see in, in human animals, that winning makes future winning much more likely. And again, positive feedback loop. Now, if androgens are more common in dominant animals, are more common in animals that are higher in that pecking order, are more common in animals that win fights, cortisols are more common in non-dominant. Cortisols are more common in those who lose. Okay? Now, cortisols are linked to stress. The more stress an individual is under, the more threat an individual feels under. And very often, at least in humans, the less likely we feel that we can deal successfully with those threats, the higher the levels of cortisols. And cortisols, remember, are linked with all sorts of rather nasty things. They are linked with, uh, higher in humans, higher rates of heart disease, higher rates of depression, increased inflammation. Generally, it's not good to have increased long-term levels of cortisols. What's kind of interesting is that I say that cortisols are more common in non-dominant animals. However, if you have dominant animals that are constantly being challenged, that constantly have to be fighting fights, constantly have to be winning fights, in those individuals you actually see a rise in cortisols as well. Presumably because they're having to deal with the threat of you know, other animals constantly challenging them, the threat that they might lose their dominant status, that they might lose a fight, that they might be injured or even killed. So if a dominant animal is constantly being challenged by other animals, then you will see higher level of cortisols. And the same way that there is a winning effect, there's also a losing effect. 
and that an individual that loses, you know, you lose one battle, it makes that individual more likely to lose again in the future. That's kind of a negative feedback loop, a negative spiral. And it may be that losing a battle causes these cortisols to increase and therefore causes it more likely that they're going to lose in the future. So, I mean, everything feeds on everything else. And so all of this needs to be considered when an individual is deciding, you know, whether they're going to fight or whether they're not going to fight. What also has to be considered is when to stop fighting. It doesn't make sense in terms of costs, for instance, that if an animal, an individual is losing, it doesn't really make sense for that losing animal to continue the fight. Okay? I'm losing. I may be hurt. If I continue the fight, there's a very good chance I'm going to get more hurt or I'm going to be killed or otherwise, you know, basically be put out of commission. So very often when animals know that they're losing, when it's clear that an, ind an animal is losing, it will awful, often either signal, you know, I, I quit, I, I'm done, I'm not going to fight back, I'm not going to challenge you anymore, don't hurt me anymore, or sometimes it'll simply turn and run, which is essentially the same thing. Now, very often this does what it's supposed to. This does indeed inhibit aggression in the winning creature because the winning animal is more or less thinking, okay, I've won the battle, I don't have to press this home. Because if the winning individual decides that, you know, what the hell, I'm going to kill this animal no matter what, then the winning individual runs the risk of being hurt more or being hurt at all or maybe, you know, getting hurt enough or having the tables turn on them. So it doesn't make sense for the winning individual then to force the losing one in, in, to, to keep fighting because that could be an additional cost to the winning. And it does appear very often that, you know, saying I quit or whatever, that it inhibits aggression. And a lot of animals have signals for this, particularly the very social animals that are not only very social, but they also have, um, you know, dominance hierarchies that show sometimes, for instance, with chimps, chimps will very often show that they are not, uh, you know, they're, they're no longer going to fight, not only by body language, but there's also called something called a submissive grin. And we see that in a lot of primates where when they're being submissive, when they're showing, hey, I'm no threat, don't fight me anymore, they'll actually pull their lips back from their teeth in what looks like to humans as a smile. But to, but to these individuals, it's, it's a submissive grin. It's, you know, I'm, I'm not going to fight you anymore. There's also sort of a fighting snarl that is showing the teeth. And those look a little bit different in how these are done. Now, I'm going to bring up wolves. I've talked about wolves before simply because there's been a lot of research in wolves. We know wolves have alpha male and female and the rest of them are, are uh, submissive to a greater or lesser extent. And we have a lot of nice in, uh, research and video about wolf submissive behavior. And a lot of wolf submissive behavior mimics what wolf pups do. Wolf pups are oftentimes showing submissive behavior, for instance, when they're begging for food. And so this behavior that we see, this pup behavior that we see when they're begging for food, we also see in adults when they're doing submissive behavior. Active submissive behavior are things like crouching where they're licking the muzzle of the more aggressive animal, okay? They've got their tail tucked between their legs completely so that it's brushing their bellies. More passive is where they will roll on their back and they'll expose their throat or expose their belly. And in some, I mean, this is basically saying to the more aggressive animal, I'm not only not going to fight back, but I'm going to put myself in a position where you can kill me. And what it does to the more aggressive animal is the more aggressive animal will usually then not do it. They'll stop. They'll pull back. They may, you know, make threats, but they won't actually do it. If you want to see really good evidence of submissive behavior, watch this video. It's wolves in a zoo. And the first one minute and 40 seconds shows a lot of aggressive behavior, shows a lot of submissive behavior. I will warn you, however, that there's very loud music here. You may want to turn the music off. But it's a really good video to look at this sort of aggressive or submissive behavior in wolves.